Hello, this is your host for the podcast of Doom, David Appleson. Thank you for your patience and for staying with the podcast as I proceed through another life event which requires that I take time away from producing new podcasts. While I prepare for my professional certification exam, I thought I would air this episode that I recorded for the History of Podcasters Project on Great Women in History. Keeping with the theme of my podcast, I felt compelled not only to choose a subject who was a powerful woman from history, but also a tragic figure. For this project, I chose Queen Isabella of Spain. This segment originally aired on September 22, 2014 as part of that project, but will now air on this podcast for the first time. For more information about the History Podcasters and the Great Women Collage Project, go to historypodcasters.com. And now, a little about Queen Isabella of Spain. In the last century, we had some great and influential women leaders. Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Benazir Bhutto. But for this segment, I'm going back to the 15th century to discuss one of the most influential women, nay, people ever. Queen Isabella united Spain, completed the Reconquista, reorganized the government in ways that are emulated today, inaugurated exploration and colonization in the New World, and initiated the Spanish Inquisition. Greetings, my name is David Appleson, and I'm the host of the Podcast of Doom. At the time that Isabella of Castilla was born into the house of Trastamara, the territory that would become Spain was a complicated place. In April 1451, the Reconquista was nearly complete, and the Christians were in control of most of Spain. Isabella's family held the kingdom of Castilla, a large domain in the western part of the Iberian Peninsula. The kingdom of Aragon controlled the east. The small Basque kingdom of Navarre was in the north, Portugal was on the Atlantic coast, and the last remnant of the Moorish emirate, Granada, hugged the south. This map would change greatly during Isabella's lifetime. Isabella was born into intrigue as second in line to the throne of Castile. Her half-brother Henry was already 26 and heir presumptive to their father, King John. Her mother, also Isabella, came from the Portuguese nobility. Two years later, her brother Alfonso was born, and in the patrilineal dominated line of succession, this dropped Isabella to third in line to the throne. Her father died the next year, making Henry king. Nominally, under Henry's care, the older Isabella moved her two children to a castle in Aravajo, where they lived in very poor conditions. It was during this time that Isabella received continuous religious instruction. Soon Henry and his queen, Joan of Portugal, produced a daughter, also Joan. Henry summoned his mother, brother, and sister back to the royal court in Segovia. The family's living conditions improved, and Isabella received an education in reading, writing, mathematics, and the arts. Henry kept a close eye on his family, never letting them out of Segovia. He was in a conflict with the nobles of the court who wished to dethrone him and replace him with his younger brother Alfonso. The forces of the nobles fought against those of the king. Eventually, Henry would agree to make Alfonso his successor, if he would marry his daughter Joan. It seemed a nice, orderly succession was in place when Alfonso died at the age of 15, probably from plague, but some insisted he was poisoned. Now things got dicey. Who was next in line for the throne, Isabella or Joan? Eventually, a compromise was reached. Isabella would be named heir, but she could not marry without Henry's consent. So there, everyone is a winner. Kind of. An unmarried princess, just like nature, abhors a vacuum. At an early age, Isabella and her mother looked to marry her off to a proper royal. At the age of six, she was betrothed to her second cousin, Ferdinand, the son of John II of Navarre. But when Alfonso of Aragon died, John inherited his realm, and suddenly that alliance didn't look so keen anymore. 
However, Isabella did catch the eye of Ferdinand's stepbrother, Charles of Viana, who disliked his father and made friends with Henry, now suddenly John of Navarre's enemy. John threw his son Charles into prison where he died of natural or unnatural causes. Henry then tried to arrange a marriage between Alfonso of Portugal and Isabella, but Isabella nixed that notion. So Henry tried to marry off Isabella to the wealthy Don Pedro Pacheco. Isabella was quite distraught by this idea, and lucky for her, Don Pedro died. Finally, Isabella made up her own mind. She would marry her cousin Ferdinand, the beau she was promised as a child. Of course, marrying her cousin violated some laws of consanguinity, not to mention it really ticked off Henry. One papal dispensation later, Isabella slips off with the excuse of visiting a sick relative. Ferdinand ducks out in disguise, and voila, the happy cousins are married. Once the star-crossed lovers figured out who would rule what, they were faced with another crisis. In 1475, a jilted Alfonso crossed from Portugal into Spain. He had married Joan and declared a war against the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon that ended in a stalemate. But politics getting the better of valor, Ferdinand won the propaganda war, and the armies of Alfonso retreated back to Portugal. In 1476, a rebellion broke out in Segovia. Isabella rode out and, against her advisor's wishes, met with the rebels. Through skillful negotiation, she ended the rebellion. Her next task was to rebuild the kingdom that her incompetent brother had frittered away. She formed a police force called La Santa Hermandad to combat the runaway rise in crime. They were funded by the crown, and its members lived in the areas they policed. Facing a bankrupt kingdom, Isabella took back the property sold off by her brother. Next, she shut down the many mints printing worthless currency and brought all production of money under royal authority. Confidence in the crown was restored. So far, so good. Isabella ended government corruption, raised the status of the legal profession, forced the nobles to perform government duties, and added clergy and lawyers to the royal council. She and Ferdinand set a precedent by setting aside time every Friday to meet personally with their subjects and hear their complaints. She organized new government ministries, one for foreign affairs, one for affairs with the church, a supreme court to review grievances, an attorney general to prosecute crime, and at long last a department of finance. Having shored up the internal affairs, it was time to address that other pesky problem, the Moors in Granada. The Muslim emirate had been around for 700 years, and Ferdinand and Isabella felt it was high time to do something. In 1482, they invaded Granada. Using mercenaries and the latest in artillery, they were able to defeat the divided forces of Sultan Mohammed XII. In 1491, Mohammed signed the Treaty of Granada, in which Isabella and Ferdinand gave their word that they would allow the Jews and Muslims of Granada to live in peace in return for the Sultan's surrender, a promise they would shortly break. The decline of Islam in the West was concurrent with the rise of Islam in the East. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks took control of Constantinople, and the change in governments obstructed the passage of trade caravans along the Silk Road. Spain's chief rival, Portugal, had already developed an alternate route to China and India going east by sea. Shortly after the fall of Granada, Isabella and Ferdinand were approached by the Italian navigator Christopher Columbus, who proposed an expedition to find a western route by sea. The royal couple agreed to finance the trip, half expecting Columbus to die in the effort. Instead, he returned with gold and slaves captured from islands in the Caribbean that he first thought were part of India. That expedition, and three others by Columbus, laid the way for Spain's great colonial empire. Disheartened by Columbus's treatment of the indigenous people, Isabella ordered that they be released and treated the same as other subjects of the crown. This is the point in our story where the good queen goes bad. Just after the fall of Granada, Isabella and Ferdinand issued the Alhambra Decree, or Edict of Expulsion. Granada's large numbers of Jews and Muslims worried the Christian faithful of Spain. 
The decree accused the Jews of subverting Christians from their faith and gave them four months to convert or leave the country. Those who refused were sentenced to death. The result was that 40,000 to 100,000 Jews left Spain for Africa, Southeast Europe, and the Ottoman Empire. Tens of thousands died during this forced expulsion. As many as 50 to 70,000 converted. Those who converted often faced torture or death at the hands of the inquisitors, who never trusted the conversos. In recognition of these accomplishments, in quotation marks, Pope Alexander VI bestowed Ferdinand and Isabella with the title of Catholic monarchs. Isabella bore a number of children with Ferdinand, but few of them survived her. Her daughter Isabella married the Prince of Portugal, but she died at age 28. Her son John married the Archduchess of Austria, but he died at the age of 19. Her daughter Catherine of Aragon outlived her, but had the misfortune of marrying English King Henry VIII, who banished her and married the younger Anne Boleyn. Isabella died at the age of 53 from natural causes. Some said she died of a broken heart after her son John had died. She left a remarkable legacy of good governance and organization, determination, conquest, and compassion. Yet she is also somewhat responsible for the terrors of the Inquisition and the exploitation of people in the New World. I appreciate your listening to this podcast project. My name is David Appleson, and you can hear more stories of famous catastrophes and calamities throughout history on my podcast, The Podcast of Doom, available on iTunes, Stitcher, Miro, and Blueberry. You can visit me on Facebook or by, on my website at www.thepodcastofdoom.com. Music